All right, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. The Bible says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims a and a flaming sword, which turned away every which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I'd like to preach tonight, the Lord be my helper on the thought, the price of redemption and the cost of sin. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your mercies that you uh, show on us every day. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of health and we look about and see other people that lack it, Lord, and we realize that we don't appreciate it enough. Lord God, tonight we pray that you be with Brother Downs and Sister Nancy. Lord, uh, you knew this before we did, and we understand and know that you are uh, going to be honored in it. We pray that you would uh, uh, keep Brother Downs' health strong, that you would keep him in the center of your will. Pray for Sister Nancy, Lord, that her health would remain as well. Lord, whatever has remained to be done there, God, you take care of it. But Lord, we pray tonight that you would honor your word as you're faithful to do. Lord, we know there's loss that meet among us, God, that needs you more than anything else. We pray that you'd make that uh, vividly clear to them tonight according to mercy and grace, Lord. And we pray for the saved here, Lord, that we might not forget you, that our lamp might be in a place where it could be seen by the world. Lord, we pray that you would bless your word according to your mercy and grace. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, we see some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, um, really the entrance of sin, and uh, it was not something that took the Lord God by surprise. A lot of people uh, want to present this as though it was God's plan B. It was not. Uh, he knew what man was made of. He knew what would occur. And more than that, uh, he had thrown Satan out and he knew what Satan was made out of as well. So this situation did not take God by surprise, but it was the very first time he got to illustrate grace. And in the, in the chapters previous to this, he got to illustrate himself as all-powerful and all-divine and all-knowing in creation of the earth Everything in it, including man, he dem demonstrated himself in that way. Now we see that man has fallen in verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, or mother, or all mother, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin. Now the price of this situation, and we're going to go back and look at how they fell into sin, but the price for redemption is always blood. The price of atoning ourselves to God has always, and, uh, has always been and always will be blood. Praise God, the, the true sacrifice was offered on the cross of Calvary, and we don't have to take pigeons and, and turtle doves and, and lambs down to the temple anymore, but we can just stand in the person of Christ. That, that is our atonement. But I want you to see that sin's price has always been blood. That is the end result of it. Now, a lot of debate, and I don't see no reason debating it. I think it's kind of foolish, to be honest, uh, of what was killed. Uh, it doesn't matter what was killed. Something had to die, and something's blood had to be spilled. That, that is the reason. That was the only way that sin could be covered. Now, I won't explore this very deeply tonight, but I do want you to see that man's idea of covering sin has always been different than God's. What did Adam and Eve do? They got them some twigs and some leaves and tried to cover everything up and then hide from God. Uh, I'll say this first of all, you can't hide from God. Right. That's an impossibility. And then secondly, I'll say this, man's idea of clothing and God's idea of 
clothing has always been different. Uh, man likes to expose themselves. You know what you see? That's one thing I don't like illustrations of God's Word. And by that I mean pictures. Because we simply have this finite mind and we can't understand it. But if you see pat, uh, pictures of Adam and Eve, you'll see her running down in a mini skirt with one little strap over the rest and him running around in, in, in just next to nothing. I believe they were well covered when this was done. Yeah. Yeah. Because God's yeah. never liked nakedness. Oh, and so, uh, whatever God whatever paid the price, the price of redemption was paid, and redeeming just brings you back into God's good grace. Redeeming uh, grace puts you back in His will, and something had to die. But despite the redemptive work, there is always a cost of sin too. The price of redemption and the cost of sin. Now if we would be very honest tonight, those of us who have been saved would say this, we're still paying for some sin. It doesn't mean we're not redeemed, but in this life you pay for sin. That's not popular preaching today. And if you say, well, you know, uh, how do you say that? Well, I'm still aging. Uh, my hair's starting to go gray. Uh, my hair hurts me all the time. I have, I have the conflicts of age, and so by that I know I'm still paying a price. And if you, uh, if you get experienced, to sin. I was, uh, maybe it's Brother Downs. We was talking about songs that from 30 years ago sometime ring in my mind. And you know the reason why? Because it's a price of sin. It is a price of sin. And, and, and it will always be with that as long as we're trapped in these ungodly bodies. So there is a price to be paid despite redemption. Uh, what a blessed thing when we go home to be with the Lord and we set uh, this flesh aside. But until then, there are prices for sin. And so, dear friend, tonight, both the redeemed and the lost, I want you to remember there is a price for sin. And, and, and it will cost us something in this present world. Now, if you would, go with me uh, back to verse 14. The Bible says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, now, if you know your Bibles, they had placed, they had played past the buck, and Adam blamed it on Eve, and Eve blamed it on the snake. So God got it down to the serpent or the snake and said, "What is this that thou hast done?" You know what? That'd be a real good question for each of us to go around tonight and say, "What have we done?" And you can take it two ways. Number one, what have we done to cause the judgment of God? And we do have it. Thanks be to God we're under grace, but there is a judgment upon us. That's right. And, and, and secondly to that, uh, think about today. What have you done to promote uh, the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? So the, the serpent became responsible. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Now, Brother Downs was slaying the serpent the other day and, and got the job taken care of. Uh, but we all saw it on, the, on Facebook. It was a snake. Now when you look at a snake and think of a cow or a four-footed creature of some kind, the most beautiful thing you could imagine probably, that's where the snake fell from. See, a snake didn't always crawl on the ground. The, the snake wasn't always fearful. And me and Brother Downs was discussing this just before church. Uh, I, don't, I don't take long enough to assess the snake to see if it's a good one or a bad one. If it's one that's needful, I should go ahead and kill. I just kill it. And then if it was a needful one, I say, oh, well, I made a mistake. And I, that, that, that's my idea with snakes. And you know why? Because I'm fearful of them. I don't like snakes. Spiders don't bother me. I used to crawl under Adam's house and there'd be big spiders in there and I'd continue with my work. Don't bother me, but a little snake, that will get me moving and get me moving quick. People typically don't like snakes. Right. But could you imagine them being beautiful? Mm. Could you imagine them being attractive? Something that would be desirable. That's what sin did, is it not? It made them from the most beautiful of cattle down to something typically most people don't even want to look at. That, that, that is the way that sin is. So we see that sin will take us 
to a place that we don't necessarily desire. Verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now that is uh, foretelling the coming of Christ. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, a couple of things I want you to see. Despite Eve passing the buck, she was still responsible. Despite Eve saying, hey, it wasn't my fault, it was the snake's fault. Despite her saying, this wasn't my doing. Despite all of that, she became responsible for her own sin. And we are too. We, we, are, we are ultimately responsible. And I want you to see what came from that. Number one, she would conceive and bring forth children. Now those of you that have children, you know what a joy it is to have new life and a family and, and have a new child. But we know it is accomplished through pain. Have you ever wondered, had, had, had sin never entered, if, uh, if childbirth would have been painless, there would be nothing to it, it would be all fine and well? Who knows? what God would have done, but I do know this, that is part of what came from sin was pain. You know sin will always bring pain. If it's childbirth pain, or if it's the pain of cancer, sin brings pain. Now we might not think so in the beginning, but it will bring pain eventually. It will, it will come in and do its job. And so, also I want you to see because of this, he, she was now under Him. You know what? That is a hated truth today. For the man to be under, for the woman to be under the man is a hated truth. And in most cultures, it is despised. And most cultures, it's violated. You know what? As much as you don't like it, ladies, you're under the man. And men, as much as you like to pass the buck, you're responsible. You're the one. You know what? You might say, well, I couldn't do nothing with her. She just did her own thing. Well, you tell to God one day when you stand before Him and that's your account of a poorly demonstrated home and I don't think it will mean much. Okay. And so we need then as men and women to take on our role. And, and you know, I, I don't know about being a woman, but I do know this, that it should be your role. My responsibility is to provide for those girls and be sure they have everything they need. And you know what? In some sense, that's a curse. If you don't believe that, about 4.30 in the morning when I get up and start getting ready for work, I'll give you a call and say, hey, I'm still under the curse, and I'll hang up and let you go about your business. Because that's what I am required to do. That was the result of the fall. That was the, the end result, is that each of us was placed in a very difficult position. I want you to see the land was cursed as well. Look across the United States. Listen, things are going from bad to worse. And you know why? We're cursed. We are a cursed people. And I know about Barack Obama. I know what a devil and an infidel he is. But you know what? We're cursed without him. We're cursed without Hillary Clinton. We are a cursed people. Why? Because of Adam and Eve. We are cursed and there's nothing to get away from it. And so we see in this day that there was a great deal, despite the atoning covering blood of whatever, whatever animal died, it was still a cost to sin. You can read further in their lives. You see them have their first two sons, and, and one rises up another against the other, and, and Cain slays Abel. I can't imagine even giving up a child. But much less having one child kill the other. That's unbelievable to me. You know what that was? That was the cost of sin. That was the cost of sin. Uh, sin has a price. Sin has a cost that you will pay here in this present world. In the now, it has a cost. Now if you will, go with me to 2 Samuel. 
Now you may be thinking, well, Brother Larry, I'm all right because I'm saved. Well, you're all right in the sense you've been redeemed, but you're not exempt from sin. 2 Samuel chapter 24, we'll begin reading in verse 9. Now, as I have many times quoted, what does the Bible say concerning David? David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man like we don't understand. He was a man that had more noble thoughts than we did. He was a man that depended on God. And as his life advanced, he learned to depend on Him more. Even when uh, Absalom raised up in rebellion against him, he learned to trust God more with less. He had a huge army. And then in the rebellion of Absalom, he got down to 350 or 375 or something like that. And he learned to trust God more. You know, that, that's a wonderful, wonderful lesson for us. When you get down to nothing, we ought to, we ought to trust God more. And so we see that this unbelievable character David does something that's against God's law. 2 Samuel 24 verse 9, the Bible says, And Joab gave up the sum of the number. Now the edict from God was, Do not number my people. And David's command was just the opposite. He went out. I said, I want you, he said, I want you to get a number of all the fighting men. That's what he was really. You know what? When you have to begin counting pennies with God, when it comes to your tithe and offering, you know what? You're not really trusting God. That's right. I, I'm not going to count pennies with Him. I, I, I know that He's blessed me abundantly, so then certainly I should abundantly give back. I, I'm not worried about penny pension with God. And, 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 and you shouldn't either. And because David thought God wasn't able, that was the real thing. He didn't think God was able. Do you think He's able? I don't know what you're facing tonight, but I certainly think He's able. You know what? Even if you don't have much faith, huh, do you think this young man that Brother Ashley shared with us about, do you think Sunday he anticipated having an event or Friday and that in the morning they were going to turn the ventilator off? A 31-year-old man. You know what that were to say? You know what? God, it's in your hands. So we find David in rebellion to God, and Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there were in Israel 8,000 valiant men that drew sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000 men. And David's heart smote him after he numbered the people. Now, did you, did you get that? He wanted that number, and he wanted the number, and he wanted to know exactly what was going on, and how many were that they were, and immediately, once he'd done it, God smote his heart. You know what? Sin is never as appealing as you think it is. When, when you get the result of sin, it's not going to be as pleasant, and, and as cheerful, and as nice as you think it was. So once he got the immediate, but you know what's a wonderful blessing? God did smite his heart. You know what? When I get out and sin, and yes, I do, and yes, you do too, when God corrects me and gives me a good slap across the face, it's a blessing to me because that's saying, hey, you're mine. That's right. You're mine. Amen. He chastises those whom He loves. That's right. Amen. And, and, and so we see then, as, as the Lord's people, David got in a situation that we very easily could too. And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have, in, in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Now I want you to see, at this point, it was forgiven. At this point, but the sin still had to be paid for. David was a saved man. David was greatly used of God. But David's sin had a price in this present life. Yeah. Yes. You know, that, that's the pro another problem with Armenian teaching. It gives us no responsibility to God, really. We pretty much do our own thing. And then when the going gets rough, we call on God, right? 
But knowing that He's sovereign is this, that when we're outside His will, there's a penalty to go with it. There is a penalty. Now, after this prayer, and He went before God, I fully believe He was forgiven. I know it didn't impact His salvation, but the sin still had to be dealt with. There is a price, a cost for sin. For when David was up in the morning and the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose the one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto the land, unto thy land, or wilt thou flee thee? Flee three months before the enemies while they pursue thee, or shall there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to re return to him that sent me. Now, David's in an unusual position because, see, most of the time we don't get a choice on the payment of our sin. He's getting a choice. He's saying, you can have disaster this way, you can have disaster this way, or you can have disaster this way. Which way do you want it? You know what that says to me? Whatever, this, whatever the way, disaster is the result of sin. You talk about a man that loved God and the nation was going to pay the price. Each one of those choices was a national price to pay. What do we have in the White House tonight? What do we have in both houses of Congress? Do you not think that we're liable? We're in a mess. And we're responsible. Sin will fall out. Sin it will become more obvious. And so, despite his forgiveness, there were still results of sin in David's life. Uh, verse 14, And David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord and His mercies uh, for His mercies are great, and, and let me not fall into the hand of man, so the Lord sent a pestilence. Now, did you get that? All He knew was to fall on the Lord's mercy. All He knew. You know what? If you're in sin tonight, all I can tell you is to fall on the Lord's mercy. If you're lost, you fall on His mercy. If you're out in sin, fall on His mercy. If you have judgment in your, in, in your life, fall on His mercy. Seek the Lord while He may be found. That is what we need. And I will say this, David never makes a choice. He says, you, you know, God, I'm just throwing you on my on mercy. But I will say this, there was still a price to pay. Now, he was a wise man. He wasn't foolish enough to make a choice. He said, God, have it your way. But there was still a price to pay. You know what? Grace is not magic. That's the problem of inviting Jesus into your heart, ain't it? it? It's not magic. And so the results of sin still remain. The results of sin stay in your life as, as long as there's life in your body. And then we get to go home to be with the Lord. And so we see that he puts it into the Lord's hand. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning and evening to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan even unto Beersheba 70,000 men. Now, again, this was in a day in census taking where women weren't counted. And neither were children. The first censuses, the first six censuses in the United States were done the same way. The only people that were written down was the men and the number of children and the number of women. That's all. Ladies, you didn't get your name written down to 1850. Uh, and so in the same way, you have to believe that there were many, many innocent people that died. All the counting is men. <laughs> and you say, well, how did you come to that? Well, do you remember when the Lord uh, broke the, the lad's bread and fed 5,000? It says 5,000 men beside the women and the children. And, and, and so we see that we don't, we're not for sure at the measure of the devastation, but we do know this, at least 70,000 men died because of one man's mistake. 
It, it, doesn't that make your heart quake? Doesn't that make you uh, fearful of even the things that you say from the pulpit and the, and the things that you say to your family? It should make us quake in our shoes that our actions could have such a, a, a huge impact. You say, well, I'm no leader. Well, you may be no national leader, but I will warn you of this. The Bible says that sin will stay with a family to the third and the fourth generation. So that means your sin, my sin, could impact Gracie's children. That, that, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that, that's pretty phenomenal to me. That, that, that's something that will stop me in my tracks and make me think, okay, am I where I need to be? Am I making decisions that the Lord would be pleased with? And so we see as the Lord's people that we need to be very careful and very cautious and look at the present impact of our sin. Don't think grace is an excuse to sin. One place more of the Gospel of Luke. Thank God for grace. The Gospel of Luke chapter 7. Luke 7. And we'll begin reading in verse 37. The Bible says, And behold a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now, you know what that means? It's all inclusive. You know what? If they began to write my life, my life story, the best statement they could start out with, Larry Lafferty, comma, a sinner. That, that, would, that would be a good starting statement for my life. And so this woman, she's no different than anybody else. And behold, a woman in, a, in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, I will say this, and we'll run on. It's one or two things that happened here. Either this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha, or there were two alabaster boxes of ointment. I don't know which. I personally think it was Mary, but that's just my own idea because it's mentioned twice. But whomever it is, we know that Mary and Martha, before their redemption, before they were saved, they were both prostitute women. My guess is they were making Lazarus a good living. And um, so the, whomever this woman was, we know that she's a sinner and she, she knows she, and, and all she has of value is this alabaster box. If you had only one thing of value tonight, would you give it to the Lord Jesus? You ever think about that? Well, you better think about it. Because you know what? The money the church has blessed me with is the only money that passes through my hands anymore. Everything else goes electronically straight to the bank. I never see it. So how easy would it be to, for them to say, that's it. You're not going to play by our rules. You're not going to get it. I think it would be pretty easy, don't you? You think, well, that's far-fetched. Well, you, you, you see Hillary Clinton come into the White House and you'll find out how far-fetched that is. Mm -hmm. one, one click of the keyboard and it's all froze up. Very, very literally. And, and so we may be reduced to whatever we have in our house. I mean, Donna don't have a whole lot, but if all there was, just say, all that's left is my recliner, would I have the grace to bring it and put it to the feet of Jesus? See, possessions are way too important to us. That's right. What we need to do is just give them to the Lord. Certainly, we can't take care of, take, with, take them with us anyway, so I don't really realize why God's people get so hung up over them, but we do. Verse 38, And stood at His feet behind Him, weeping, and began to wash His feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now we won't go a great deal into uh, into foot washing. That's my not my purpose here, but I will give you this for food for thought for the remainder of the week. The Bible teaches us very clearly in First Corinthians eleven: a woman's hair ought to be long, right? You know, if I came in here with 
with my 80s dude that I used to have. Y'all are ready to be putting me outside that, wi- outside that door. And well, so, then why can women turn around and get theirs cut off like mine? And everybody go, oh, you're the best in the whole world. Oh, not to be. Not real pleasant preaching, is it? But it is fine. It is Bible. And, and so we see then, this woman could not have washed his feet and dried it with her hair doing like this. She had to have some hair which she could do it with. Does that make sense? And, and so we see that she very humbly does this act. Now when the Pharisees which had now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, that says me what you thought. <laughs> spake within himself saying, <laughs> This man, if he were a prophet, would have known what manner of woman this is, and, it's, and she that touches him, for she is a sinner. So we see that self righteousness come up. And you know that he's rebuked very soundly of the Lord in a very, in a, in a very correct way. But that thing that she did for the Lord. She was a forgiven woman. She was a saved woman. But she still had that price. You know, I'm sure when she went down, I think once she got outside the city, she was probably all right. But (laughs) the test the testimony was this in her hometown, she was still alive. And she never left that. I don't mean she didn't leave a sin behind. That testimony went with her. Young people, listen to me. That testimony will follow you. In that group of people, you will never really have a very good testimony with. So we need to be very, very cautious with what we do. And all we do is like David, go down before the Lord and, and put it in His hand. But don't get upset. And used to, when I was a little bit younger, my friends... If they kind of blew me off, it'd make me mad a little bit. But looking back now, you know what? I deserve it. (laughs) Why would I listen to me if the situation was reversed? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so sin has something you'll take with you the rest of your life. And so we need to be very, very cautious of it.